Okay, so first of all, I would like to welcome everybody and thank you all for being here today. And I just, I'm just going to take a few minutes to talk about this webinar and about the participants. Uh, this webinar is part of a, a larger uh, conception that we have. Uh, Cesar, me and Raquel, we are three uh, scholars uh, willing to foster uh, interaction uh, between disciplines in research on cognition and, and language. And there are a seri series of initiatives that we have been having since 2018 involving uh, biannual events, uh, workshops, publications, and this is the first webinar of, of our, that we organized together. Um, so we have uh, this, I think what's specific about our initiative is this um, will or this, um, this effort to bring different areas together to talk about these topics that we focus on, namely cognition and language. Um, uh, the people that are going to speak today are people we know. I have met Tom in Cambridge, Elena I've met in Unicopi, and Giovanni is um, an old friend from Cesar and I've met uh, in, I think 2019, right Giovanni, last year. We are very good friends now, but it's not very long ago. Um, Tom is a lecturer in the Faculty of Philosophy at the University of Cambridge and he researcher, he does research on philosophy of mind, psychology, metaphysics, aesthetics and philosophy of business. He's very known for his work on affordances. I know him for his work in, in affordances. Um, and he's going to talk today about mental affordance. Thank you, Tone, for being uh, willing to, to do that. I also want to thank our, our home institutions for, for the support they give, you, give us and for and our funding agencies, CNPK and FAPESP, for the support as well. Uh, Giovanni is an associate professor of philosophy at Federal University of Bahia in Brazil. His background is in traditional epistemology and philosophy of mind. And his recent, re recent research focuses on embodied cognition and radical and activism. His most, in his most recent papers, he has developed a radically inactive account of rationality and an inactive ecological account of information, together with Professor Eros de Carvalho. Uh, he's interested in exploring an inactive ecological account of cognition which involves combining the notions of sensory motor regularities and affordances, and whether this combined approach is capable to explain the so-called high cognition. Elena Pertizotti is a postdoctoral fellow at the Interdisciplinary Nucleus of Sound Studies at Unicampi in Brazil. She's Italian and she's here uh, for a postdoc. Her research is on the behavioral changes and multimodal interaction within a performative space called Be Creative. On her studies of music to musical technologies, she has developed and patented a prototype musical software, winning the Prometheus Prize for Innovation. From an interdisciplinary perspective, she's investigating the possibilities that the concept of affordance offers within the interactive technologies. In her previous publications, she has introduced the con concept of multiple affordances, also referred to as multiple tra tra trajectories. <laughs> Elena and I are planning to work a little bit more on the concept of affordances. Uh, together from now on and I think this workshop is like a terrific start for us on that. Um, and um, 
last but not least, I'm just going to stop talking. I just want to say that I'm very happy about uh, the reach of this webinar. We have people that subscribed from Germany, Portugal, Israel, India, Denmark, Japan, Colombia, Australia, Hong Kong, France, Turkey, Brazil, South Africa, England, Canada, Ireland, Greece, Taiwan, Thailand. These are 19 countries uh, of people who subscribed that were interested in the topic. So that's so amazing. And we have all the five continents uh, here today. Uh, Cesar had a joke about that, but you're recording. I'm not sure if we're... <laughs> Yeah. No, no joke. Okay. No, no, no. <laughs> um, okay. <laughs> you so, just have to stop sharing your screen so that Tom okay. can. Tom can share his screen and please, Tom, uh, take the word and be very welcome. Okay, so if that's working, you should all be able to see my screen now. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, let me start by um by thanking everyone for coming, um thanking Nara and Cesar for organising it and inviting me, and uh, also special thanks to Elena and Giovanni for agreeing to to respond to this paper. Um, so this is a paper about the idea that we perceive attentional affordances, and I'll explain what that means in a moment. So let's start off by just thinking about what affordances are. So I assume if you've signed up to this talk you probably already know something about affordances but it's worth uh, worth pinning down exactly how i conceive this notion um so we we all know that the concept of affordances was introduced by the ecological psychologist james gibson so in one of his later works published posthumously i think he describes affordances like this he says the affordances of the environment are what it offers the animal the verb to afford is found in the dictionary but the noun affordance is not I have made it up. I mean by it something that refers to both the environment and the animal in a way that no existing term does. I particularly like the way that he flags up that he's made a word up. I think philosophers should do that more often. But another thing to take away from this is the heart of the idea of affordances is the following. Something can afford an action for a subject. So if I say that um, uh, a cup affords drinking from for me, Yes, it's a property of the cup, but it's a property that the cup has relative to me. So this concept of affordances was introduced by Gibson. It was picked up across a whole range of different disciplines. So you'll find it in music, anthropology, design theory, artificial intelligence, neuroscience, cognitive psychology, and more my end of research, phenomenology, and philosophy of perception. So the fact that this concept has been picked up so widely kind of indicates that Gibson was onto something intuitive and something theoretically valuable. But the flip side of this is that the different uh, people applying this concept apply it in slightly different ways. So it's a concept that's almost taken, it's fragmented, it's taken on different meanings for different people. So it's important for me to pin down exactly how I'm understanding affordances. And I'm not too worried about whether uh, I'm in line with Gibson. So a lot of what I'm going to say in this paper isn't very Gibsonian. But I don't care, that's fine. Um, so here's a technical definition of affordances. X affords phying for S if and only if X is a possible target for S is phying. So here X is something normally an object that has the affordance. Phi is a variable for an action like catching or walking or eating and S is a subject. So let's apply that to a specific example. The teapot has the property of being grippable by me. So right now there's a teapot in front of me uh, and that thing has the property of being grippable by me. Okay, so it's a property the teapot has, but it has it relative to my abilities as an agent. It affords gripping. Now, one way to understand this is in terms of pairs of dispositional properties. So on the one hand, we've got my dispositional property of being able to grip things. That's like an ability I have. I can grip all sorts of objects. Um, but then there's this other dispositional property. There's the teapot's dispositional property of being grippable. 
So when I say that a teapot affords gripping, what I'm really saying is that there's this pair of interconnected dispositional properties. So when we talk about dispositions, you often get pairings like this. So if a sugar cube has the disposition to dissolve in my tea, the flip side of that is that my tea has the dispositional property of being able to dissolve sugar cubes. Okay. So when we talk about dispositionals, you often get two sides of the same coin like that. Okay, now the claim that things afford actions to us isn't in and of itself particularly interesting. I mean, who could deny that things are grippable and eatable and catchable and so on? Gibson's innovation was to suggest that these are properties we perceive. He also made some bold claims about how we perceive them, but that's something I'm not going to get into. So what Gibson claimed is that when you look at the teapot, it's not the case that you just see a load of colours and shapes and textures and then kind of infer that an object with those properties can be gripped by you. Instead, you can actually see it as grippable. Its grippability is right there in your perceptual awareness. And he thinks this is very important for explaining how we act and explaining how animals act. Right? Animals, you might not have the capacity to, to rationally evaluate what actions they can perform. Instead, they can just see what actions are available to them. So that's Gibson. That's what's important in, uh, in Gibson's arguments. But if we move forward for uh, a few decades, this concept was picked up by cognitive neuroscientists who think they discovered that when we perceive affordances, the neural process responsible for us performing the afforded action gets triggered automatically. It kind of gets prepared automatically. So when you look at this teapot, for example, there's a motor process responsible for you reaching out and grabbing the teapot. And as soon as you see the teapot under the right conditions, that motor process gets automatically activated. You might not be aware of it, but there's indirect evidence that we'll look at later on that suggests that that happens. Right? So when Gibson introduced the concept, he wasn't thinking about um, this kind of stuff that much at all. Um, but it's kind of been transformed over the years. And um, now a lot of the more recent literature in cognitive neuroscience is concerned with this concept of potentiation, the kind of automatic readying of a motor process in response to the affordances that we perceive. So that's a slightly trickier concept, and I'll explain that a little bit more later on. So in the, in the, um, in the vast literature on affordances, almost all of the affordances that have been discussed are affordances for bodily actions, like walking, climbing, eating, drinking, sheltering. Um, but one thing that doesn't normally get a look in are affordances to attend. Okay, so I'm not the first person to suggest this. Uh, Max Jones, who I think is here with us today, definitely got there ahead of me and has incredibly valuable work on the topic. But sometimes people forget that, not me. Um, well, I'm going to focus on affordances to attend. Okay, so the idea here is as well as perceiving things as affording gripping and climbing and eating, you can perceive things as affording attention. So the kind of attention I'm concerned with here is focal attention. So when you shift the focus of your attention, that's an action. It's like you're putting the spotlight of your attention on something else. Now, just because something is in the spotlight of your attention, that doesn't mean it's the only thing you're attending to. Right? You also have a kind of peripheral attention to stuff that's going on in the background. That's not what I'm focusing on. I'm focusing on the act of changing the focus of your attention. So with that in mind, we can say that X affords focally intending for a subject S, if and only if X is a possible target for S is focally attending. So let's have an example, right? This is what people's desks sometimes look like. Mine doesn't look so picturesque. But if you look down at this desk, there's a whole bunch of attendable items. I call them attendabilia, right? Possible targets of attention. And each of those things has the property of being focally attendable by me. And just like with the teapot case, this involves a pair of dispositions. You've got my dispositional property of being able to target my focal attention in certain ways. And you've got the item's dispositional property of being a potential target of focal attention. Okay, so we can say that that, that teapot or that laptop, they're all focally attendable by me. Now, I hope that saying this isn't too controversial. In a way, there shouldn't be anything interesting about this claim. Who could deny that things are attendable? What's interesting is what comes next, right? It's the two questions that this raises. The first question is, are these attentional affordances 
perceivable. So it's one thing to say that a teapot is attendable. It's quite another to say that we can perceive it as attendable. I want to argue that we can indeed perceive things as attendable. And second, the question is, um, does perceiving attentional affordances under the right sort of background circumstances potentiate a shift of focal attention? Does it automatically trigger and prepare a shift of our attention towards that object? The second one might still be a bit harder to understand, but I will explain it in more detail later on. So I think there's some uh, interesting uh, initial reasons for thinking that our answer to these questions might be yes. And that is that those who study uh, action, ordinary bodily actions, and those who study attention have noticed close parallels between the two. So here's Posner, a hugely influential figure in the study of attention. He says, on a very general level, it seems that evolution has selected similar principles of movement for the hand, the eye, and covert visual attention. So what he's saying is the way that bodily actions work is much the same as the way that attention works. Right? So Posner wasn't looking at affordances, but one thing we might notice is this. The ordinary bodily action is guided by our perception of affordances. It stands to reason that attention too might be guided by our perception of attention on affordances. So that's not a conclusive argument, uh, but it does give us some initial reason to think the answer to these questions might be yes. Okay, so I'm going to take these two questions in turn uh, with the remaining time, about half the time on perception and half the time on potentiation. So let's think about this claim that we can perceive attentional affordances. So I want to make a case for the conclusion that we do indeed perceive attentional affordances. And I'm going to adopt a specific strategy for motivating that conclusion. And the strategy is this. First, forget about attentional affordances and just think about the reasons we have for thinking that we perceive classic ordinary bodily affordances like affording gripping affording walking affording catching and then once i've done that try and work out whether there are parallel reasons that can be found for thinking that we perceive attentional affordances now if we can find those parallel reasons then by parity of reasoning we ought to conclude that we can perceive attentional affordances. There would be something inconsistent about denying that we perceive attentional affordances. So I'm gonna go through a series of parallels. Um, no single one of these parallels is gonna do the job, I think. There's always room for a little bit of doubt. But I hope that the cumulative effect of all these different parallels together make a compelling case for the conclusion that we do in, indeed perceive things as affording attention. So here's the first one. This is first person evidence for our perception of affordances. Now I've kind of color coded my slides here. So if it's blue at the top, I'm talking about classic ordinary bodily affordances. And if it's yellow at the top, then I've flipped over to attentional affordances just to help you keep track. So forget about attention for a second, we're on classic affordances here. Um, some people think there's first person phenomenological evidence for thinking that we do indeed perceive affordances for bodily action. So if you think about what your experience of this desk is like, obviously we experience all sorts of colors and shapes and textures when we look at this. But in order to fully capture what your experience of a real life table is like, there's this whole other dimension to your experience. Objects just seem to be available for your interaction. They seem to be ready to hand as Heidegger would say. And this is a kind of feature that some people feel they can isolate in their visual experience. So I see the teapot as pourable, I see the nuts as edible, I see the cup as drink frommable or something. Now, this comes out particularly vividly when we think about um, skilled action. So there are some cases where there are affordances that we can't perceive, and yet when we learn a new skill, suddenly we find that we're able to see affordances that we couldn't previously see. Right? So if you notice that change in your visual experience, you can thereby notice your perceptual experience of affordances. So learning to drive gives you particularly vivid examples of this. I only learned to drive a few years ago and to begin with, every decision I made was incredibly slow and deliberate. I had to work out, is there enough room in that gap in the traffic to get in there? And by the time I'd worked it out, it was too late. Okay, But over time, my um, my perceptual capacities changed and suddenly I was able to see 
that a certain gap in the traffic was big enough for me to get the car in. And now when I drive, I don't even need to think. I can just see the gap, move into the gap, and there's no need for any reason. And my visual experience of the road has changed as a result of the skill I've acquired. Similarly, if you learn to um, uh, a particular sport like tennis, you can make perceptual discriminations that a mere novice could never make. Okay, so a tennis player has to be able to make incredibly rapid decisions. And one thing that helps them make those rapid decisions is the ability to see whether a ball is gettable, whether it's volleyable, whether it's drop shottable. Right? And when this happens, they're perceptually attuning themselves to affordances that a novice cannot see. And their perceptual experience is therefore different to the perceptual experience of a novice. Okay, so let's flip over to attention and see whether there's a parallel. I think there is. I think we do indeed experience things as being available for focal attention. I think right now, whatever visual experience you're having, there's a whole bunch of stuff in your visual field. And I think you're aware of stuff in your visual field as attendable. So hopefully your focal attention is directed on me in this talk, but stuff in your peripheral awareness still seems available for attention. Now, this isn't a new idea. I think we can actually read William James, one of the kind of key figures in the history of the study of attention, as saying something pretty close to what I've just said. So here's a very famous quotation that's been cut and pasted into literally thousands of papers on attention. James says, back in 1890, everyone knows what attention is. It is the taking possession by the mind in clear and vivid form of one out of what seems several simultaneously possible objects or trains of thought. Now think about the bit I've highlighted in bold there. What James is saying is that when you focally attend to something, you're picking that thing out of a whole field of attendable items. So I think the best way to describe this, this seeming that James is talking about, this appearance, is that we have a perceptual experience of a whole bunch of attendable stuff, and then we direct our focal attention to one of those things at the expense of others, or to an area of those things at the expense of other areas. Here's another case that might help motivate you. If I flash this image up to you, I imagine your focal attention alighted on the alarming orange figure in the center of the image, right? It's a highly salient figure for all sorts of reasons. And your awareness of the surrounding items be much more fuzzy, okay? So you know that in peripheral vision, we aren't particularly good at discriminating shapes and colors and so on. You still have some awareness of the surrounding crowd. Right? It's not like you think I've just popped up an image of Trump and there's no background crowd. Okay, you're very, you are aware of the crowd in some sense. And I want to suggest that part of what characterizes that peripheral awareness is that you're aware of the crowd as attendable. Right? So just as when I look at a desk full of stuff, I'm aware of the different actions I can perform on them. I'm, I'm aware what actions they make available to me. Similarly, when I look at this image, I'm aware of the peripheral people in the crowd as available for attention. That's part of what my perceptual experience of this overall crowd is like. So here's what Alva Noe says on the topic. He says the crowd is present in that it is available to you, and it is available to you in distinctively visual ways. It is accessible to your directed looking, which is the visual equivalent of touching. So I think Noe isn't necessarily thinking about attention in quite the same way as I am here, but it's definitely pretty close, right? He wants to say that those peripheral items are kind of available for our focus in a certain way. And then if we think about cases of skill, I think we find some other vivid examples of learning to see attentional affordances. So one interesting thing that happens when you learn to drive is your, your situational awareness changes. This is a concept that comes up in the um, psychology of skilled action. Just the way a busy road seems to a skilled driver is completely different to the way a busy road seems to a novice. And one thing is a skilled driver is, is kind of aware of a different set of options for their attention. Right? They're aware that there's cars over here they can attend to. They're aware that there's a certain pattern of traffic in front of them they can attend to. Now, it might be that a novice just couldn't attend to that particular pattern of traffic. There's some nuanced gestalt of um, a traffic situation that you only become attuned to once you're a skilled driver. So that's something that used to be unattendable for you when you're a novice. 
but that becomes attendable. And when it becomes attendable, your visual experience changes. Here's another example based on Hutchins. This was suggested to me by Julian Kiverstein. When somebody first points out the constellations to you, it's quite difficult to see them. Right? The first time you looked up at Orion, for example, you wouldn't have been able to pick out that pattern with your focal attention. You have to be taught how to see it. Now imagine the experience of a complete novice looking up at the stars, right? They can see a bunch of stars and maybe a few random patterns. But then think about the experience of an expert astronomer. Instead, they see a kind of vast set of constellations and they can flip their attention to Orion, to Ursa Major, to Cassiopeia, whatever. Is Cassiopeia a star or a constellation? Never mind. Um, they can flip their attention around uh, in any of those ways, right? So they have different attentional affordances to those of a novice. Okay, so here I've tried to give you first person phenomenological evidence for thinking that we perceive classic affordances and for thinking that we perceive attentional affordances. Now, sometimes that helps as an intuition pump, it helps motivate the conclusion. But these arguments are always going to be limited because we endlessly disagree about what our visual experiences are like. So I've, I've got involved in all sorts of different debates about what visual experience is like, and nobody can agree on anything. Right? So it's a bad idea to rely too much on this kind of first person evidence. Okay? So let's put the first person evidence aside and see if we can back it up with some other stuff. So here's something, let's think about the function of affordance perception. So again, forget attention for a moment. Why would we perceive affordances? If there's no explanation for why we would perceive affordances, then it's pretty implausible that we do perceive affordances. On the other hand, if we can make a case for why affordance perception would be adaptive, would be useful and valuable, then that lends more credibility to the conclusion that we do indeed perceive affordances. So I'd like to think about the problem of action selection. So this is a problem we face as agents all the time, and it's the problem of deciding what to do next. So you have all sorts of capacities to perform different actions. At any given time, there are thousands upon thousands of different things you could do. And somehow you've got to pick what to do and you've got to pick well. This is a challenge, right? And we need a cognitive architecture that helps us meet this challenge effectively. Now, what's been suggested is that the capacity to perceive affordances helps us to meet that, that challenge. And it helps us to meet that, ch that challenge by telling us what our options are right here and now. So as I look at that desk, for example, uh, I'm aware of the actions that I can perform on the objects in front of me. And then all I really need to do is pick which of those actions to perform. All I have to do is decide between eating the nuts or pouring the tea or typing on the laptop. And 99.9% .9 of the different possible actions I can perform, like driving or juggling or bungee jumping, I can just ignore them if I want to. So this menu of possible actions in perceptual experience helps me pick what to do next. I don't have to pick from the menu, but where I do, life is easier. So do we find the same kind of thing with attention? Well, I think we do. Attention clearly presents us with a challenge of action selection as well. You can only focally attend to so much. And one of your challenges as agents with a capacity for attention is to work out what to attend to next. And we need help in that challenge. We need a cognitive architecture that helps us select the right things at the right time. And this actually comes up in the empirical literature on attention. So here's Laurent Itty. He says, visual attention may be a solution to the inability to fully process all locations in parallel. So that's a brief description of why we have this capacity for attention. But then he goes on, however, this solution produces a problem. If you're only going to process one region or object at a time, how do you select that target of attention? Now, there's lots we can say in answer to that question, but I think part of the answer is this. It's that we have a perceptual experience of the different things that we could attend to right now. We're perceptually aware of our options, right? We don't spend time trying to attend to unattendable stuff. Right now, I'm not tempted to try and attend to the back of my head or attend to the far side of the moon because it's not an available option for me right now. Instead, I just select from the options that are actually before me right here and now. So again, I call these options for attention attendabilia. These are different possible options for attention. 
So if we perceived affordance, uh, affordances to attend, it would have this function of supporting action selection. Okay, here's a third parallel. This is a case of affordance misperception. So in the philosophy of perception, philosophers often appeal to, appeal to visual illusions to help reveal the contents of our perceptual experiences. If you want to know how perception works, it's a good idea to look at where perception goes wrong. That gives us a clue as to how perception works. And affordance perception is no uh, exception to this. Um, it looks like we can misrepresent the presence of an affordance. So here's an example. To this cat, it perceptually seems that this gap is jumpable, but sadly, it's not. My cats are constantly misperceiving affordances. They're really not good at it. Um, and Ben Sinyane gives another example. Imagine you're in a conservatory with the doors closed and somebody outside throws a ball and it comes right towards the glass. Right? There's no way the ball could come in the house and no way you could catch it. And yet sometimes you find yourself doing this, right? You try and catch the tennis ball. Now, why does that happen? Well, Nane has an answer. He says the ball perceptually seemed to be catchable, even though you knew that it wasn't catchable. Right? So this appearance is cognitively impenetrable. It doesn't matter if you believe that the ball is going to bounce off the glass. Your perception says there's an incoming ball, you can catch it. And that would be a case of affordance misperception. So can we find cases where we misperceive something as attendable? Now that seems really unlikely, right? Because everything that you can see is surely attendable. So it took a bit of digging, but I think there are actually some examples of this. So think about the Hermann grid. This is a very long-standing illusion introduced in 1870. Hopefully if you look at this grid, you'll have the following experience. You know, the intersections of the white lines, you'll have an experience of these vague gray dots. But what you won't find is a gray dot where you're foveating or where you're focally attending. So as you look around, the gray dots kind of disappear. So I'm tempted to interpret this illusion as follows. Those gray dots are unattendable. They cannot be attended to, and yet they appear attendable. Even though you know how the illusion works, it's almost like every time you try and attend to the gray dot, there's this feeling of surprise, right? Because they just seem like they should be attendable. And it's almost surprising every time that you shift your eyes or you shift your concentration and suddenly they disappear because they can't be attended to. They're only present in peripheral awareness outside focal attention. Just like with the case of Nane's tennis ball, this is an appearance that persists regardless of your beliefs. So as soon as you've had a look around the illusion and got a sense of how it works, you will form the belief that the dots are unattendable and yet they still seem attendable. So that means that appearance is a perceptual appearance, right? Because it's do doxastically impenetrable. It's not something that's responsive to our beliefs. Okay, so that's the third parallel. We're zipping through. Let's have a look at the fourth and final parallel. And this is to do with deficits in affordance perception. So in the context of various uh, cases of brain damage or psychiatric disorders, the concept of affordances has been used to describe what's gone wrong. So here's one interesting example. This is optic ataxia, also known as balance syndrome. So this is a condition in which subjects have difficulty grabbing objects, and yet they can see those objects perfectly clearly. There's nothing wrong with their vision. They can discriminate shapes and colors perfectly well. They know what they're looking at. And yet when it comes to reaching out and grabbing it, they get it wrong. They miss, they use the wrong kind of hand grip, etc. Now this has been explained as a deficit in affordance perception. Okay, so someone like this subject can see the shape and color of this spoon, but they just can't see its gripping affordance. They can't see that it requires one to go like this to grip it. And if they can't um, perceive that, then their action of gripping is going to go wrong. So here's what Blakemore, Wolpert and Frith say. They say inverse models, these are the neural models that help guide action. Inverse models do not use the affordances offered by the shape of the object to be grasped appropriately when computing the motor commands required to make an action. So that's a technical way of saying, if affordance perception goes wrong, you won't be able to do stuff anymore. So the presence of this deficit gives us indirect evidence that typical subjects, subjects without optic ataxia, are guided by a perception of gripping affordances. 
So can we find something similar in the case of attention? Well, I put this forward very tentatively, but something I'd like to think about more is the idea that a condition called unilateral neglect can be understood as a deficit in the perception of attentional affordances. So this is a condition in which subjects ignore things in one half of their field of vision, so one, one hemi-field of the visual space. But here's the thing, it's not that they're incapable of attending to them. If forced to attend to them, they can be made to attend to things in that hemi-field, but unprompted, they never will. So here's an example. Subjects with unilateral neglect were asked to copy this picture of a cat on the left. And then here's what a subject did. They drew all the bits of the cat on the right-hand side and then said, right, I'm done. That's finished. And they were oblivious to the fact that they hadn't drawn the left-hand side of the cat. Similarly, a subject who tried to shave themselves shaved one half of their face and said, right, I'm done, because they were oblivious to the fact that the hair on the right-hand side of their face was completely untouched. Now, here's a way of describing this condition. I suggest that these subjects fail to perceive items in that hemifield as attendable. So we, uh, I assume no one here has unilateral neglect, we all have a perceptual experience in which the whole field of vision has a tendability in it, right? Stuff all over the place seems attendable. Whereas if you have unilateral neglect, the field of attendable items is restricted to just one hemifield. Those things no longer seem attendable. And if they don't seem attendable, then why would you attend to them? It's just not on your menu of options for focal attention. So you're never going to focus on it. It's not because you can't focus on it. It's because you were oblivious to the fact that they were possible targets for focal attention. Okay, so I've, I've identified four parallels so far. Here they are in summary. You've got first person evidence from the experience of things being available for action. You've got the function of affordance perception, which is to support action selection. You've got cases of affordance misperception, and you've got deficits in affordance perception. And for the cases uh, in ordinary classic affordance perception that fit, fit those four categories, we can find parallel cases for attentional affordances. So insofar as everything in the blue column gives us good evidence that we perceive ordinary affordances, the stuff in the yellow column ought to give us good evidence that we perceive attentional affordances. Okay, so that's affordance perception. Let's move on to this trickier topic of potentiation. So the concept of potentiation was introduced in the 1990s by Tucker and Ellis, a pair of psychologists. They said this, the perception of an object results in the potentiation of the actions that can be made toward it, i.e. the potentiation of the ob actions that the object affords. And this potentiation involves actual activation of motor representations of those acts. So the, the neural motor processes responsible for, for performing the afforded action get potentiated when you see those things, which means they get activated. It doesn't mean you have to act on it, but it means that neural process gets fired up, readied, prepared. But here's their core claim. They say that visual objects potentiate actions even in the absence of explicit intentions to act. Right, so if I look at my teapot and plan to reach out and grip it, then obviously the motor process responsible for me reaching out to grip it will get prepared, right? Obviously that's gonna happen. But their claim is this, even if I look at my teapot and have absolutely no plans to grip it whatsoever, the motor process responsible for me reaching out and gripping it will be readied nevertheless. It will be readied automatically, at least under the right background circumstances. Exactly what the background circumstances are is contentious, so I'm just going to bracket that for the sake of this talk. But I have it in mind that there's some need for qualification there. So this raises the following question. Right? We're assuming, uh, in light of the first half of my presentation, that we do indeed perceive attentional affordances. So the question is this, can the perception of attentional affordances automatically potentiate a shift in focal attention? When something pops up that's focally attendable by me, does the neural process responsible for my attention shifting towards that thing get readied automatically? So for example, 
if I look at these objects, the motor process is responsible for me acting on them, get readied automatically, at least under the right circumstances. But I've been focusing on the fact that all these things are also attendable by me. So when I look at this desk, does a shift of attention towards any of these things get automatically readied, prepared, triggered? You might think, oh, that would take a lot of empirical work to answer, right? This is just a hypothesis. But actually what I'd say is the following. The empirical work has already been done. All we have to do is reframe a whole load of existing research, existing research into attention and to visual salience. So salience is what guides our atten attention towards certain objects. I suggest that existing studies of visual salience give us exactly the parallel we need between what happens with the potentiation of bodily actions and what happens with the potentiation of shifts of attention. Now, one thing to note here is, um, if I can indeed make a case for the conclusion that shifts of attention get automatically potentiated, that gives us some indirect evidence for the first conclusion I've already made. Right. Because if it's the case that shifts of attention get potentiated by what we see, that's evidence that we see them as attendable, right? Just as all these studies of how a teapot can potentiate the act of reaching out and gripping gives us indirect evidence that we perceive the teapot as grippable. So there's a little kind of dialectical loop in my argument here. My, uh, my case for this second conclusion supports my case for this, for the first conclusion. So here's Tucker and Ellis again. Hopefully the concept of potentiation will become more clear to you um, once you understand the uh, experimental study they did that inspired this concept. So here's the study. Subjects were presented with a series of images of objects and were given the following task. They had to specify whether the object presented was upright or inverted. So this one's inverted. Uh, and what subjects had to do is push a button. They had a left-handed button to push if the object is upright and a right-handed button to push if the object was inverted, or vice versa in other trials. So in this case, if I'm subject in the study, I have to push the right-handed button to specify that the teapot is inverted. And in this case, I'd have to push the left-handed button to specify that the teapot is the right way around. This study really involved teapots, by the way. It's not just my obsession with tea. Um, it's the truth. And here's what Tucker and Ellis found. They found that response time was faster when the direction in which the handle of the teapot was facing matched the required button push. So in this case, for example, I'd have to push the left button. If the handle is pointing to the left, then my response time is quicker than it would otherwise be. In contrast, if the handle is pointing to the opposite side, my response time will be slowed down. So if in this case I needed to push the right hand button, the presence of a teapot image with a handle on that side, lending itself to a left-handed grip, would slow down my response time. So here's how they explain this. They say, look, in this task, gripping the teapot is completely irrelevant. In fact, it's just an image of a teapot. Right? You couldn't grip it even if you wanted to. But what they think is, when you look at this teapot, the act of reaching out and gripping it with your left hand gets automatically triggered, prepared, potentiated. And that means if you actually need to perform a left-handed button, button push, you have a kind of neural head start, right? A left-handed action has already been prepared the second you saw the teapot. So that's going to improve your response time when you decide to push the left-handed button. In contrast, if you need to push the right-handed button, you have a neural handicap because the process of reaching out with your left hand rather than your right hand has already been prepared and fired up. So what your brain has to do is quickly cancel that and then start a right-handed movement from scratch, which is going to be slower. So with this study, the behavior indirectly points to the presence of this unconscious potentiation of afforded action. So here's the question. Can we find parallels with attention? Well, actually, some long-standing classic studies of attention parallel it quite nicely. So here's a kind of um, study famously introduced by Posner. Subjects are given a screen with a black dot in the middle and they're to told to focus on the black dot. And if the dot goes green, you have to look to the left. And then Posner measured response time, like how long it takes somebody to shift their attention in response to the 
dot going green. But in some trials, he introduced a distractor. So just before the dot goes green, an irrelevant distracting object pops up, like a red flash or something. So let's say the distractor pops up and then it goes green and you have to look to the left, not in the direction of the distractor, for example. Now what Posner found was this. Uh, Tom? Right in the direction you're meant Tom, to we just attend. Lost the connection then response time you. was slower. I'm sorry okay. to interrupt. Okay, I'll, I'll wait. lost the connection no, no. for two minutes. If you can just say again what you just said. Okay, is it, is it clearer now? Yes. Okay, I'll, I'll just go through the Posner bit again for anyone who didn't get that. Um, so in the Posner study, if the dot goes green, you have to look left. But before it goes green, you might get a distractor cue. Now, in cases where the distractor cue matches the direction in which you need to attend, response time is improved. In cases where the distractor cue is incongruent with the direction you need to attend, response time is slowed down. So just as perceiving the irrelevant gripping affordance of the teapot interferes with your performance of a manual task with your hands, it can interfere with it for better or worse, depending on whether there's congruence there. Similarly, perceiving an irrelevant attention affordance interferes with your performance of an attentional task. So Posner never described this in terms of affordances, but what we can see now is that there's a perfect match between the results of these different studies. Right? I can describe the results as following. The irrelevant cue afforded attention, and even though it was irrelevant, that meant a shift of focal attention towards that cue was prepared. And in congruent cases, that acted as a neural head start, and in incongruent head cases, that acted as a neural handicap, slowing down response time. Okay. That's the parallel of interference effects. Here's another parallel, which is response capture. So sometimes there are cases where um, the potentiation of afforded action happens very powerfully and very quickly. And in cases like that, we act involuntarily. So for example, um, if you're driving down the road and a small object comes in front of the road, you might feel the urge to swerve around it, but maybe you can resist the urge if it's not safe to do so. In other cases where it happens very quickly and the potentiation is very strong, you just swerve involuntarily. You've swerved before you even know what's happened. Here's another example, and this is a baseball player being interviewed, and then this ball comes in and he just instantly catches it. Now, I don't know exactly what's going on in this guy's brain, but it looks like this, this is happening far too quickly to be deliberate, okay? He perceives a catching affordance. It happens very quickly. He's a trained catcher, so he's got this kind of automatic response, and involuntarily he catches the ball. If he didn't want to catch it, it probably would have been too late, right? He probably would have just caught it anyway. So this is something known as response capture. It's where we involuntarily perform an afforded action. And I think we find exactly the same thing with attention, right? The sudden onset of a salient stimulus, something that occurs quickly and contrasts a lot with his background, can cause us to attend involuntarily. Now, there's interesting work on the exact circumstances under which attention is captured, but we don't need to get into that. The important thing is sometimes attention is just captured involuntarily. So here's an example when you're driving, right? If something vaguely distracting is going on on the pavement, right, you can stop yourself from attending to it. But if something like this happens in front of you, you're going to attend to it whether you like it or not, because this is a highly salient stimulus that's just going to capture vocal attention. So just as the baseball case is explained in terms of the potentiation of an afforded catching action, this case is explained by the sudden strong potentiation of an afforded act of focal attention. Now here's a third kind of evidence. This is direct neural evidence. So in the teapot case, we were extrapolating what's going on in the brain on the basis of behavioral patterns. But actually this stuff is backed up by direct brain scans, okay? So when you present someone with a teapot with the handle pointing towards their right hand, the motor process involved in reaching out and grabbing a teapot kind of lights up a bit, right? Not as much as it does when you actually reach for a teapot, but it happens, okay? So the brain scans reveal that this potentiation occurs. Actually, if we look at the um, neurological studies of attention, they can be described in much the same way. 
So some really interesting work on something called the priority map, which sometimes people think is in the lateral intraparietal area, though um, thought on this subject has changed recently. And this is a neural map of your visual field that represents the different things you can attend to. And things that catch your attention correspond to a lot of neural activation, and things that are easy to ignore are mapped with much lower levels of neural activation. So here's an example. Subjects were given the task of picking out um, the red circle from this. Neurally, what you find is a map of these objects with different levels of neural activation corresponding to the different attendable objects. So there, the red triangles correspond to a low level of activation. The yellow triangle kind of contrasts with its surroundings. So even though yellowness is irrelevant to the task, you'll see slightly more activation for the yellow triangle. Whereas the red circle pops out the most because the task is to look for a red circle. So there's this kind of combination of bottom-up signals to do with how much something contrasts with the background and top-down signals to do with what task you're currently performing. So Bisling Goldberg says that greater priority is represented by greater neuronal activity and the peaks of the map are read out by the visual system to guide attention. So this is kind of the potentiation of shifts of focal attention. It's not described in those terms, but the kind of functional profile of this is much the same as the functional profile of what we find with classic bodily actions. So even though they don't talk about affordances, I think we can. We can say that the priority map is a map of attentional affordances. It's a map of attendabilia, and different att attendable items potentiate shifts of focal attention to different degrees. So the whole topic of salience can be understood in terms of attentional affordances. Now here's the last thing I'll consider, and that is deficits of inhibition. So again, put attention aside and think about your classic affordances. There's a rare and extremely interesting condition called utilization behavior caused by damage to specific areas of the frontal lobe. And subjects displaying utilization behavior compulsively act on affordances. They compulsively utilize the objects that are in front of them. So here's a, a study from not too long ago. This was a man who'd suffered the relevant brain damage and he was presented with a hairbrush and a toothbrush. And without any prompt, he immediately used both objects, right? He used the toothbrush to brush his teeth and the hairbrush to brush his hair, right? And you'll notice this man doesn't even have any hair, okay? So there's absolutely no reason for him to use the hairbrush. But he seems to be just compulsively acting on the affordances in front of him. That's how some people have chosen to explain this phenomenon. And this has been explained in terms of disinhibition. So when an ordinary subject looks at a hairbrush, the process of reaching out and gripping it and brushing with it gets automatically triggered. But further down the line, that signal then gets suppressed. Okay, and that's where the frontal lobe comes in. That's the area of the brain responsible for that kind of impulse control. But that's exactly the area of the brain that's been knocked out in people with utilization behavior. So that impulse that everyone has now gets disinhibited. So they have to act on every affordance that they see. Now, I don't think there are cases where we have absolutely no control over attention, but I do think there are plausible cases in which attentional signals are disinhibited. And that is ADHD. I mean, if you want to describe ADHD, what better way to describe it? than a deficit in the control of impulses to attend. Now, interestingly, um, like utilization behavior, ADHD is associated with atypical features of the frontal lobe, the area of the brain responsible for self-control and impulse control. And what we also find is that ADHD isn't just characterized by um, uh, atypical patterns of attention. It's characterized by impulsivity more broadly. Right? So one way of thinking of ADHD is a, a partial deficit in the ability to suppress the impulses that are triggered by the affordances we perceive. And that includes bodily impulses. So if you have ADHD, it will be difficult to resist the temptation to fiddle with bubble wrap, for example. But it will also be difficult to resist the temptation to attend to stuff you shouldn't be attending to. So if it's the same, whether it's bodily action or attention, I think that gives us good reason to think that attention is guided by these affordances and the potentiation of afforded action. <laughs>
Okay, the last one I want to discuss was about the phenomenology and it involved slapping Justin Bieber, but I don't have time to explain that right now. So I'm going to flip straight to a summary of what we've got. So those are the three uh, things we covered there, interference effects, response capture, uh, direct neural evidence. Oh, and we did also cover deficit of inhibition. And there's a phenomenological thing I could talk about later if we want. So I think they, they, all of this justifies the following conclusion. Firstly, do we perceive attentional affordances? Yes, there are good reasons to think so. And does perceiving attentional affordances potentiate shifts of focal attention? Yes, again, I think there are good reasons to think so. So I think this sheds light on how attention works, how visual salience works, but I also think it opens up a different area of inquiry uh, on which I've been working for a few years now. And that's the possibility of expanding the scope of affordances so it's no longer limited to just bodily actions, but it includes mental actions like attention and maybe a whole bunch of other mental actions as well. So maybe an interesting documentary affords the mental act of reflection. Maybe a fork in the road affords deliberation. Maybe a photo album affords reminiscing. Maybe a difficult sequence of steps affords the act of mentally rehearsing your next step before you take it. Maybe a fantasy novel affords imagination. Maybe a place of worship affords contemplation. Perhaps a jar of marbles affords the mental act of counting. And maybe a good idea affords evaluation. To make a case for these things, we need to look at them on a one-by-one -one basis. Um, but I think the prospects for this are good, and I've, I've argued as much in recent work. So if there's a one take-home lesson from this, it's that we shouldn't assume that all afforded actions are bodily. Thank you. Thank you. It was wonderful, wonderful presentation. I think we have a five-minute break now. If you want to get some water, go to the toilet. And we start with the comments in five minutes. Vani, and I'm going to count here the time roughly. Giovanni and Tom have 15 minutes. And then Elena and Tom have another 15 minutes. Uh, after that, we're going to the Q&As. If you want to start preparing your questions for, for that, um, and if you want to ask a question, just please type on the chat. And then uh, either you type the whole question or you just ask to speak and we're going to give you the space to ask. Um, so please, Giovanni. You... Thank you. I'm going to take these headphones off. I think this... Is it better that way? Can you hear me all right? Okay. Thank you, Nara. Thank you, Cezan. And thank you, Tom. That was a uh, great, great talk. It was uh, very clear and very convincing, I think. It's very compelling, uh, a very promising subject. Um, I have a couple of questions, but they are regarding the first part of her talk. Um, it's mostly about the parallels between uh, the, the, the classic notion of affordances and the idea of attentional affordances. These are not objections by any means. I just, I'm not, I don't know if I got your point on a, on a few things. So you said in the beginning that you're okay with, um, if you're not strictly uh, in tune with Gibson's view, and I'm okay with that too. That's not a problem for me, but I just want to, to understand how far the, the parallels go. So for Gibson, and I think for a very good reason, affordances refer both to the environment and the animal. And I'm not sure in the case of mental affordances, if this distinction holds, I'm not, I don't know if I get what is the, the mental environment and the, the animal in this case, I don't know if this is, I'm not saying this is a problem. I think maybe at some point the parallels break. I, I, I don't think that's an objection per se, but, and Another thing, well, you can answer that and I can ask you the second question later, I don't know, or I can go for my second question. I could go on, it gives me more time to think how I should answer the first question. Okay, so, um, and the other thing is that for the, the, the classic notion, uh, the perception of affordances is direct. 
and uh, I think this well gives lives, gives some some leeway to avoid representationalism and uh, well he was arguing for a realist view of perception in, uh, as his main point but um, I don't know I'm not sure if the idea of um, how do you put it? Attentional illusions, maybe? I, I think that's your term. Uh, it, I don't, I'm not sure if it's compatible with the idea of direct perception of affordances in general. I'm, I, I just don't get this, the idea of how you could directly perceive an illusion. And maybe I'm being too disjunctivistic about perception, but um, um, this is something I couldn't understand as clearly as the other things. But I think in general, it's, uh, it's very compelling, as I said in the beginning. I think these are minor questions I, I'd like to, for you to answer, but thank you. And thanks for the invitation, Cesar and Nana. It's been great to participate. Thank you. Yeah, two two really important questions. So um, I'll take those in reverse order. So I think this topic of direct perception is quite important. So one of the influences that Gibson's had on philosophy of perception is this idea that you can just directly perceive stuff and that you shouldn't think of perception in terms of internal representations. Um, now, I think that idea is compatible with the idea of mental affordances. Um, but, but, you know, it doesn't have to be, right? And here's why. I'm happy with the idea that we just perceptually represent affordances. So that component of Gibson, I think he's probably mistaken. Um, and other people like Susanna Siegel and uh, Bense Nane, he doesn't use the word affordances, but Bense Nane certainly says similar things to Gibson. They just have representationalist conceptions of this, right? So there's a debate about which properties we represent. And they say some of the properties we represent are affordances or action properties. So officially, I'd like to take a kind of neutral view on this because it's tangential to the question of whether we perceive mental affordances or attentional affordances. Um, but in reality, I'm kind of just a representationalist. So it probably creeps in some somewhere that I don't buy into the direct realist component of Gibson. But specifically with the topic of illusions, um, I'd flip it around and say that the presence of illusions regarding affordances are good reasons to reject direct realism. Okay, hey, so well, never mind. The of, yeah, yeah. So, so never mind the context of affordances. Illusions are a problem for all direct realists. So, uh, as many of you know, there's like a vast literature looking at how color illusions or shape illusions could possibly be explained by direct realists. So, I think one thing. Uh, where I should be more careful is when I say um, we perceive the grey dots um, as attendable. Maybe something's gone wrong there because if I say that you per I perceive something, that implies that that thing is real. If I was being more precise, I'd say something like this. You have a perceptual experience as of attendable grey dots or something like that. Okay. So I'm not really perceiving anything there. It's, it's, it's an illusion there, hallucinated objects. So I think that's a kind of um, a misleading phrasing on my part. But really what I care about is what the contents of our perceptual experiences are, not really whether those experiences latch on to reality in the way that a direct realist like Gibson would want, want them to. Okay, thank you. Oh, and the environment. Yeah, okay. So, uh, so can, I, can I check whether that's answered your second question first? It does. I think, well, you still could argue for the idea that when you are misperceiving the, the disattentional affordances, you, you are entertaining a different kind of mental state or... Uh, so you could still... You are still neutral, I think, on this issue if you, if you make... If you rephrase the, the, the specific point, I think you don't need to commit to the idea that you are perceiving in, in both uh, the, the actual case, the, the, good, the positive case, and the, the case of illusion or something like that. So okay. that, yeah, it yeah. does answer, so but I think just to complement. Yeah. So it's have to rephrase what the illusion is. It's where you kind of change from perceiving stuff 
to yeah. having a mental state that introspectively seems like perception but isn't or something yeah, yeah. just like a distractivist would yeah okay good um so with the with the environment thing um i do struggle with this point so when it comes to kind of ordinary gibson style affordances you can make sense of how the affordance involves like the mug having a load of categorical properties like its shape and so on and my hands got these categorical properties like its shape and the affordance is there because of a kind of match between these physical things whereas when it comes to mental action that's a bit weirder so if something is attendable that hasn't really got much to do with like the physical constitution of my body or even the physical constitution of stuff out there in the world but I think the parallel does still hold, right? So, for example, some things that don't contrast enough with their background are unattendable, right? So think of like a moth that's camouflaged on some tree bark. Uh, are there some moths behind you there on the pictures behind you, Giovanni? Looks like yeah. in your <laughs> Yeah, they're, they're, all, they're all visually salient, but let's say there's also a white moth in there that's cleverly camouflaged on your wall, okay? So that would be something... Um, that's unattendable by me because of its physical properties, just like some things are unliftable by me because of their physical properties, right? So I think the physical constraints on mental action are gonna be broader and weirder and harder to pin down than the physical constraints on bodily action. But I think they are there, right? Yeah. And really what matters is just that you've got your mental capacities and you've got stuff that you can direct that mental capacity towards and you've got stuff that you can't direct that mental capacity towards. And so long as there's that difference between stuff that's fireable and not fireable, then the concept of affordances should get some grip. Great, yeah, that, that does, yeah, I think it answers my question. Thank you. Okay, but I do, I do agree with the other thing you said, which is that there might come a point where the parallel breaks down, and that's completely fine with me because the whole point of mental affordances is they're different to bodily affordances. Yeah, right? you don't want to be re reductivist about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. So, so I think it's fine in the right situation for me to say, you're right, that is completely different to how bodily affordances work. So in a way, you can kind of see it as the project of drawing parallels. Right? If you imagine my kind of table of parallels getting longer and longer, there's going to come a point where it runs out, and then we have to have a separate table of all the things that are different, right? And there's yeah. got to come a point where that happens, right? So it's not going to perfectly match. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Elena? Hello, hey everybody. Hi, Tom. Hi, Giovanni. Thanks, Nara, for, for this webinar and for and also Cesar for the technical support over there. So uh, if you, you don't mind, I would like to, to share with you just to Two slides, two, three slides, yes. Okay, if you can see it. Yeah, so you can see it, right? Can you hear me? Oh, okay, perfect. So, well, just that, um, okay. Um, in my, well, in my research um, field right now, where I'm, I'm researching over behavioral um, changes and multimodal interaction within performative spaces, that is like a DMI. So I would like to introduce a bit about this because it's, it's a different, I mean, it's, it's another field. It's an interdisciplinary approach that I have. So that, that's why I'm here probably that now invited me. So, um, a DMI, I don't know if you know it, but anyway, is, is a musical instrument, right? That can be very different, that it is very different from a, a traditional one. That, so it has uh, the physical and uh, the, sh the shape could be very different. That is to say that also a bottle of water could be, could be a, a musical instrument. So, um, and for me, it's, it's very important because I'm applied a DMI in my research for a therapeutic purpose, okay? so. Um, I would like to show you first a, a kind of DMI, a, an instrument, a musical instrument in which you have to use your whole body to, to, um, to have an audiovisual feedback. As you can see here, it could be very different, uh, a digital musical instrument, but this... Mm -hmm. 
very, very short, but what I want to say is that with your body, like you can have, you have the opportunity to create an audiovisual feedback, okay? So you can imagine that a DMI opens to a very wide range of opportunity and possibility that for example, you can play an instrument, a musical instrument, also you don't have a lot of uh, knowledge about it because you can design the instrument tailoring on the needs of the person. We are always speaking about therapeutic approach, right? So um, most in particular, this be creative, that is, behavioral and creativity okay uh, has an autophonic system that means that you are surrounded by the sound and uh, um, then there is consonance and dissonance feedback that are linked to your fluidity the movement okay and also there is a color that change everything is linked together and in this context affordance would be something like specific movements that give specific audiovisual feedback so how to define affordances in this scenario of course this is not um, it's not something that you see, right? So it's like a possible path, I can say multiple affordances, like a possible path that are available to the subject and that it depends on his interaction. That is, when you enter in this scenario, you don't see physical objects, but you have different kind of possibility. Of course, you have to learn and to learn things that are not over there, but you have a bunch of opportunity, just to say what you say also before, right? like a bunch of attainable stuff available for you, but you have to learn to explore. And then uh, doing so, for example, when you use your arm or your leg, you reach exactly one affordance that is audiovisual feedback precisely. And you can use it in order to create music to express yourself, right? So this is why you are creating a sort of sensory motor maps in this way that are very linked to these affordances. And of course, another point that is important is the control, because in this environment, you are gaining control. Once you are exploring, you are learning how to use these multiple affordances and to how your sensory motor, your maps that you make up theory. And then you can uh, so create a sort of co-determination with all these things. That means that you can control the, 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 the environment, you can express yourself empowering and you can of course, create, but these points for me are very important because when we talk about music therapy and therapeutic recovery, we have to engage the person. The person must willing, must, you know, want to do the things that helps him to recover. So um, thinking about all this, I was wondering just what do you think um, in this scenario, would it be um, a good scenario which to, to, to observe at least uh, in uh, mental affordances, that is affordance to, to attend more in specific, because you know you, you, you get inside this BMI, this specific BMI where you cannot see anything, but again, when we say it, you have to learn it, to explore. And also at this point, um, I know that reading your, your paper was talking about rehearsing, right? Like uh, uh, the mental act of rehearsing, but would it be better in, in this scenario talking about mental art of planning because it's not really that you are rehearsing watching uh, the, the stone right it, it's something different you have to create something inside your stand like imagining so and just this i hope i know that it's very dense so anyway i hope it's clear thank you that's that's brilliant thank you so much i, di I didn't really know about this technology i've done I've, I've seen kind of similar technologies in action but not this one in particular so I think it's it's a really useful case, uh, and it kind of relates to a few different things I've talked about already. So one thing is, um, we were talking earlier about trying to get a grip on the idea that our environment can have mental affordances. Because when it comes to physical stuff, it's easier to make sense of, but mental affordances, it's a bit weirder. And I think this example really helps highlight that, because it's a kind of virtual environment, and all of the affordances don't involve like contours of shapes and so on the kind of thing that Gibson was interested in so in a way then they're, they're more natural things to describe in terms of mental affordances because you could it makes it easier to put aside this idea that affordances involve clunky physical interactions between bodies and objects right so I think, I think that's really useful I think it also gives a really good vivid case of how um, learning a new skill um, reveals affordances to us, right? And the reason it's so good is because when you start out 
you just have no comprehension of what's going on and you have to discover it in a short period of time so i mean i'd have to do it myself to be sure but i imagine you get quite a vivid change in what your perceptual experience of the environment is like as you start out with a kind of meaningless environment where there's no affordances or any very limited affordances and then through a process of exploration you discover all these affordances and then by the time you're done you're kind of experiencing a landscape of affordances that wasn't there before now, interestingly, all the affordances were there waiting for you, right? Yeah. You know, it was it was really possible for you to do these things to create the noises, but you had to explore it to discover it. Uh, and this concept of affordances has been used uh, in really useful ways in the in the context of how children learn to do stuff. Um, so one of the things that young children do is just play around with stuff aimlessly. And one of the one way of framing that is in terms of the investigation of something's affordances, right? So you get something and you kind of chew on it, throw it around, you know, try and see if you can stick it up your nose, right? Just discover what it affords and what it doesn't afford. Right? Uh, but then as adults, we don't really get that opportunity to start from scratch, start from the beginning with something that often. Whereas an environment like the one you've just described, it's like we go back to that infant state where you've got no idea what the affordances are and we have to mess around until we discover it. It's like an accelerated version of what's happening in the brain of an infant over many years of, of playing and babbling. Um, so I think it definitely fits with the idea of attentional affordances. I think when you first go into this environment, you don't know where to attend, right? Because it's not, it's not built into discrete objects. Um, and then presumably by the time you've got used to it, you know what the parameters of attention are. So even if there's something over here that you're not attending to, it's there in the kind of menu of attendable things once you've learned how to understand it. So your awareness of the options for attention will change. Um, but also, I think, it, as you said, works nicely for uh, mental affordances more broadly. So you can learn to see things as affording the act of planning or, or whatever. I mean, there's so many different mental actions we can perform. And case by case, we can think about what role that mental action might have in your engagement with this technology. So, um, yeah, brilliant. I, I think I agree with everything you said, and I think it works really well. Thank you. Yeah. Very nice example with the children. Okay. Uh, if you don't have anything else to say, Elena, we we can move to the Q and A's. Is that fine? Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you. It was wonderful. <laughs> uh, our first question is from Filippi Carvalho. Filippi. Uh, yeah. Can you can you hear me? Okay. Okay, so uh, thanks, Tom, for the presentation. It was very nice, very clear. Um, I have a, a, a question. When you, before you started to go into all the empirical work that's supposed to support your view, you said like, well, the empirical work has already been done. We just have to reframe you know, visual salience, for example, in terms of um, perceiving things as attendable. So I guess what is not yet very clear to me is uh, what is the explanatory gain we'll have in reframing things in this manner. I mean, when you say like, oh, instead of talking about visual salience, let's talk about perceiving things as attainable. Instead of talking about a priority map, let's talk about a map of attainability. You know, instead of talking about, say, when you're talking about you know, skill learning or improving certain skill, instead of being certain patterns being salient, let's talk about certain patterns being perceived as attainable. So what, what explanatory gains do we have by reframing things in this manner? I mean, one thing you can say is that, you know, you can now incorporate your analysis, you know, into the vocabulary of um, Gibsonian vocabulary in terms of ecological psychology, but I mean, this cannot be the only reason, right? I suspect that I mean, there should be independent reasons why I should want to understand this uh, attention phenomenon, you know, in the terms that you're proposing, and even if I don't care about you know, using a funny vocabulary. Yeah, uh, great. I think that's a really good question. And it, it taps into a, a worry I have about the literature on affordances. Because sometimes you read a paper that applies the concept of affordances 
and you worry that it has no explanatory value at all. All they've done is kind of found a way of using the Gibsonian vocabulary, but left the phenomenon in question exactly as it was. And, you know, it's kind of achieved nothing. Right? So, I, so I do worry about what you just said, but I, I think I've got a few answers to it. So one is this. I think um, part of the job of um, philosophers and people on the more theoretical end of psychology is to take a look at the big picture in a way that psychologists often can't because they're specialized in very particular things. So a philosopher might ask a really general question like, how does action work or something like that? The kind of question too broad for any psychologist to consider. Right? And it, those broad questions are useful for navigating a uh, topic and for understanding you know, natural phenomena on a certain scale. So if it turns out that attention does work in the same way as bodily action, that helps us fill in the big picture and that's something that's theoretically useful even before we get to the, any specific predictions, right? Because we can say, look, we don't have to um, always keep a sharp distinction between bodily actions and acts of attention and mental actions. There are these respects in which they work in the same way. Uh, and maybe you'll only notice that when you start working in the kind of way that philosophers like me work rather than just focusing in on specific areas, right? So that's like the first cognitive gain. Um, the second thing is to do with our phenomenology. Okay, so an awful lot of this work on attention uh, is completely indifferent to what the first person experience of attending to stuff is like. It's all about these subpersonal neural processes, and often it's very hard to reconcile the kind of scientific image of attention with our everyday manifest image of what it's like to attend to stuff. And one of the good things about the concept of affordance is is that it um, sheds light on what our experience of acting in the world is like. So in a way, the science of salience perception is kind of neutral on what our visual experience of stuff is like, what the experience of salience is like. Um, but what I'm suggesting is, well, I've got this new vocabulary to describe it. I'm making a prediction about um, what the phenomenology of salience and attention is. Right? And the prediction is this. It's just the same as the phenomenology of bodily affordances and bodily action, but just for a different action. Um, third and finally, um, I've been talking about these parallels between um, bodily affordances and attentional affordances, and I've been focusing on the cases where the parallel is already evident. But if we kept on trying to do those parallels, we'd find cases where it's not clear whether the parallel is there. Right. So a valuable thing that theory might do is generate new questions that wouldn't have occurred to you until you framed attention in terms of affordances. Right. So if there's an interesting study of what happens with gripping affordances that has no counterpart for attention, well then great, you've just inspired a new experimental question about attention. So even though, so it will yield more hypotheses um, as you go into the topic in more detail. That's it. <laughs> Thank you. Our next next question is from Andrew. Hi, uh, just coming in. One second. Uh, sh can you see me? Not yet. Yeah. Uh, if not, I'll just I'll just speak it. If, uh, if it doesn't. Okay. Okay. Uh, I see. I'm getting an error message, so I'm happy to just speak it. Hi, Tom. Thank you for that. Hi, Andrew. Uh, really enjoyed that. Um, and thanks for the conference, guys. Um, so I wanted to ask you, asked, uh, if you could clarify the role, the exact role of the Herman grid illusion in your argument and in doing so perhaps say a little bit more about the notion of attention in play in your claims because it seems there's you know, things you can be talking about when you talk about visual attention, you can be talking about uh, foveation or fixating, literally moving your eyeballs and looking at something. Or you can be talking about whatever that kind of internal awareness is. And the two, the two can come apart famously. So if you fixate on something, you can still attend to something in the corner of your eye, perhaps. And it seems that they're very, they're very different kinds of answers when it comes to the Herman grid uh, illusion, at least for me. So the, 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 you've got the, where the intersections, the lines are, it seems that there are black dots. But as soon as you turn to fixate on one of the black dots, it disappears. And I taught you to be arguing this is an example of a misrepresentation of an affordance of attention. Now, it seems it is in one sense and it isn't in the other sense, because I, it seems for me I can fixate on a spot and still attend to the, the grey dots in the corner of my eye and they don't disappear when I do so in that, in that other sense of attention, the second sense. 
So I wondered if you could say a little bit about those uh, those concerns. Thank you. Uh, good, yeah. Um, I'm just going to share my screen again so that people can see the illusion again. It might help. Uh, da -da 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 -da. Okay. Yeah, so that, that's a really good question, Andy. So I have kind of deliberately fudged that distinction between covert and overt attention. Okay. So, but what I want to say is that we can find illusions where things are unattendable in both senses. So some people find that with the Hermann grid, if they keep their eyes fixated on the intersection, if they try and shift their covert attention to the gray dot, it does disappear. Okay. So actually they've got exactly the opposite experience of what you said. Um, but I, I'm, yeah, uh, but there, there's a better case. There's another related illusion uh, called the scintillating grid illusion, which I think I have here. I, I'm, I, Give me a second and I'll share it because it's worth doing. Oh. Just share a different window now. Does that work? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Okay. So this is a bit different. So if you look at the white dots, little black dots appear within the white dots that you're not focusing on. Now it works in much the same way as the other illusion, but unlike the other illusion, experimenters have specifically looked at the effect of covert attention on the scintillating grid. And what they found is that um, shifts of covert intention do make the black dots disappear. Okay. That's a bit simplistic. What they find is that they often make the black dots disappear, right? I think it's like 60% yeah. change in probability or something. Um, so in those cases, there's an illusion of attendability, of covert attention as well as overt. Um, so I hope if, if, if we kind of get, if we find the right case uh, with the right background supporting evidence, I can find a case where we yeah. just perceive things as attendable, yeah. But okay, you, good, you're yeah. Right that, that, put pressure, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that, that's that's reassuring to hear because I, I had taken you to be, uh, but perhaps wrongly, perhaps mainly focused on um, on a on covert attention. It, se it seemed to me that overt was more akin to the traditional cases of bodily affordances and perhaps not as interesting theoretically in terms of a new claim. Um, but I might be wrong there. Um, yeah, I think so. In, in the con you know, I've got this background project of wanting to make a case for mental affordances. So to that extent, it's the kind of mental aspect of attention that's most interesting. But in another sense, I don't want that to corrupt the claim I'm making here, right? I only mentioned the broader set of mental affordances at the very end of the talk, right? Maybe it's just an interesting question. Are there affordances to attend, right? And you can think of attention as uh, bodily or mental or as a hybrid. Other than Max, nobody talks about that. So it's worth thinking about whether you can make a case <laughs> for such a conclusion okay um whether you then categorize it as mental or not who cares right um you could argue i mean i care because i care about mental affordances but you know that's that's one of the reasons for fudging that distinction in the talk right i see thank you very much for that clarification that's done. thank you our next question was from from jefferson but he said it was already answered and then the next one is max It's a bit it's a bit quiet max Hello. can you hire up your volume um so i guess unsurprisingly i agree with almost everything um, you had to say really but i guess it's kind of linked to andrew's question really um uh, the one bit i guess i don't agree with is the, is the last slide where you say that attentional affordances are going to be mental affordances only. i think the worry is that that kind of a lot of the um intuitive cases that you put forward are going to be cases where you really are moving your body or reorienting and it might be that actually in in kind of ecologically valid scenarios true covert attention is going to be really rare right i mean posner had to work really hard to get people to not move their eyes um, and to check that people weren't so i kind of wonder yeah it's this similar worry that maybe the whole thing does become quite uninteresting if if attention is just another kind of bodily affordance because you you wouldn't be surprised by that yeah 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 so I, I i feel the um i feel the pressure of that worry so i think one thing i'd say is 
if it's unsurprising, that's still good, right? So let's just say that attending is a bodily act, right? You can reframe everything I've just said in the following way. People have been banging on about bodily affordances for ages, but other than Max, they've missed out a really important bodily affordance, which is affordances to bodily attend to something, okay? And then we might get all the theoretical advantages that I talked about in response to Felipe's question, right? And we can do that without mentioning the category of mental at all. Um, another way of thinking about that is, I mean, you talked about how Posner had difficulty kind of isolating cases where you just covertly attend. But one way of thinking about attending is that it is a hybrid action which involves two processes that generally come hand in hand. The overt process of foveating and the covert process of shifting concentration. And there's a deep functional connection between the two that means it's very difficult to do one without the other. But that doesn't mean the mental thing isn't happening, right? So that means I can, uh, I can phrase what I've just argued for uh, in a couple of different ways. I could say that there's two different kinds of attentional affordance, and most of the time they come hand in hand. Things afford foveation, and they afford concentration. And concentration is a mental action, and it's pretty cool that there are affordances for this mental action. Another way of looking at it is the act of attending is just the act of attending. Right? From the perspective of the agent, I just don't make the distinction between the covert aspect of attention and the overt aspect of attention. So what's afforded to me is attending. Right? Subpersonally, there are those different bits, but what's afforded to me is this hybrid act. And if it's a hybrid act that has that mental aspect, well, then it can act as quite a good gateway case for mental affordances. You've got kind of pure bodily affordances. You've got hybrid bodily mental affordances. That might be what attention is. And then you've got mental mental affordances, like imagining and so on, which are... Really... So when I've previously made the case for mental affordances, I like to start with attention because it's very difficult to be on board with bodily affordances and then to deny attentional affordances. But then once I've hooked you with that, we can start having affordances to calculate and deliberate and evaluate and so on. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I'm going to let my question to the end because there are a lot of people who want to, to speak. The next one is Francesco Fanti. Yes, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Okay, perfect. So my question may take us a little bit too far. If that's the case, I apologize. Uh, I would like to know if you consider um, attentional affordance as possibly related to hypothesis generation and abduct abductive reasoning. Um, maybe an example could I clarify what I'm, what I'm meaning. Uh, for example, in medical diagnosis, uh, it seems that the ability to form correct diagnosis depend on, depends on the ability of the directing attention to certain symptoms. So we could also frame, frame this in, in terms of skillfully detecting attentional affordances of symptoms uh, in, order, in order to generate an hypothesis. I would like to know uh, if you have considered this, this idea and what you think about it. Good, yeah, really good question. Yeah, um, uh, I I have considered it, uh, and the original version of this talk had a bit more on skills and how they affect um, affordance perception. And I think what you said is right. Um, you know, most of the work on skills tends to focus on very physical skills like playing tennis and so on, but really cases like medical diagnosis. Mm -hmm. Um, offer more vivid ways of capturing the importance of attentional affordances. So I think like the difference between a, a, a bad doctor and a good doctor might be their ability to detect certain things as attendable. So if you're looking at a scan of a body, for example, there are some things that experts can focus on that a novice just can't even see, right? And beyond that, there's also how likely you are to attend to it, right? So let's say a novice and an expert can both attend to this little blurry patch on a scan. It might be that only the expert's attention is pulled towards it, right? It's only salient to the experts. So that might be another mark of expertise. Um, so I think that works pretty well. And also it helps capture cases of um, kind of injustices in diagnosis, okay? So where uh, a medical practitioner 
fails to attend to the right things in the right way because of particular biases they have, maybe based on the demographic group of the patient, well, then things can go wrong, right? And that doesn't matter. You know, that's like before they've made a judgment. If their attention is going in the wrong place, then things have gone off the rails before they've even got any further. Uh, and that's something we've actually got a project application in at the moment at Cambridge that we're going to look at those injustices in more detail. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, David Spurrett. Hi, yes. Thank you. I, I think this is probably a question of clarification, but I'm just wondering, is the claim not just that, that we can or do perceive attentional affordances, but that I perceive all of the ones that are genuinely uh, potentially affording for me, or, and, and, and then a follow-up, it's a version of the same thing, is the claim that then some of those attentional affordances, even just the, the focal attention ones, do some of them potentiate or do they all potentiate? And, and depending on the answer, maybe got some pressure to put. Good, yeah, I can, I, can, I can see the trap you're laying there and it's, <laughs> it's, it's an important one. So, uh, so yeah, I, this is very important. So uh, if we're talking about ordinary bodily affordances, if we could perceive all affordances, it would be terrible, right? If you look at a piece of paper, it affords a thousand and eight different actions, right? If you perceived all of those, that would be really bad, right? So we definitely need to have some kind of filter that means we're only perceiving a very small elite of the affordances in front of us, right? So that's true in the case of bodily action. I think it's also got to be true for attention, right? Right now, I can focally attend to any specific region of the visual field in front of me, right? And there's no way I'm aware of every single, like, micro unit of my visual field as focally attendable. Right? Instead, I'm just um, aware of a kind of high-level menu of the main targets of focal attention, okay? Um, so we've kind of gone from, like, loads of targets to a much smaller number of targets in terms of the contents of perception. Then we get the question of potentiation, right? Do all of those things potentiate the afforded action or is it just a subset of them? Uh, I think that's an empirical question, but we have initial reason to think it's implausible that all those things could be potentiated, right? Um, so again, we've got reason to think there's a filter and the empirical evidence in the bodily case suggests that we only perceive affordances when they're in some way loosely relevant to the task that we're performing okay so even the gripping of the teapot for example initially tucker and ellis said gripping the teapot was completely irrelevant to what was going on but since then people have said well it's still relevant in the sense that you're performing a manual task with your hands and your brain is trying to work out which hand to use so that means the handle of the teapot is indirectly relevant okay so you have to be primed in the right way for that gripping affordance to affect you and I think that's true of attentional affordances as well. So if I was, um, if I'm doing a philosophy talk, then certain features of what's in front of me are going to be more salient than others. If I'm playing Where's Wally, then it's different, right? Different things are going to be attendable. Uh, different things are going to pop out. So that potentiation is going to be filtered in terms of what's relevant. So the answer to both your questions is no, right? It's not the case that we perceive all bodily or attentional affordances, and it's not even the case that the ones we perceive all involve potentiation. Okay, no, that's great. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. The next question is from Ellie. Uh, she typed here on the chat. Tom, would you rather uh, read or do you want, should I read? It's how might the perception of bodily and mental affordance interact? Does the perception of attentional affordance then give way for the attended perception of bodily affordance? I.e., the teapot is both attendable and then the attention gives rise to the possibility of the perception of grabability. Is it the case that attentional affordances precede the perception of bodily affordance? Yeah, that's, that's a really good question. Um, my internet froze for a second, so I didn't hear who asked that. Should I read it again? 
Ellie. No, I got, I got the question. I just didn't hear who. Okay, okay Ellie. Oh, yeah. uh, thank, thanks. Yeah, that's a really good question. So I think there's reason to think that the interaction works in both directions. Okay. So as I was saying in response to the previous question, we aren't aware of all the affordances in front of us. Right. And one of the things that determines which affordances we're aware of is focal attention. Right. So let's say I'm looking in a toolbox. I'm not aware of all the affordances of every single tool in there. I'm only going to be aware of the ones that I focus on. Right? So that means in that case, the attentional affordance opens up our access to the bodily affordance. But there are also cases where it's the other way around. So there's a, a good set of studies suggesting that we attend to the features of an object that we can interact with. So if an object, an unfamiliar object, has a handle, for example, our attention is much more likely to alight on the handle first. Right? So the affordances in front of us help guide our attention, right? because most of the time you want to attend to stuff that you can act on, right? because that's the whole point of attention ultimately, is to influence how we do stuff. So it's useful if what we're attending to are affordances. So I think they interact in both directions in interesting ways. Okay, thank you. Next question is from Josie Seaman. Are affordances dynamic? If they are dynamic, what is the relationship between affordances and representations? What is the difference between the affordances of objects with which you had previous experience and objects with which you had no previous experience? Yes, so I think when we talked about these cases of skilled action, I think our prior experience clearly makes a big difference to the affordances we perceive. So one thing is, if there's an action that you can't perform, then you're not going to perceive things as affording that action. Right? So I'm not going to perceive things as jugglable, as affording juggling, until I've learned how to juggle. Right? So that's one way in which um, prior experience might alter my affordance perception. Another thing that might change is how much an affordance pops out to me. Um, so it might be that once I become a skilled tennis player, then a volleying affordance is going to be the thing that captures my perceptual awareness, where in a novice it might not. Um, yeah, so it is, in answer to the question, it's highly dynamic, it's responsive to the skills we learn, but it's also responsive to the particular task we're performing right here and now. Thank you. Uh, the next question is from Robert, but you do, you might want to jump in, Robert, because there you, you, so, you yeah, yes. There we go. Um, uh, yeah, so it's a kind of lengthy, uh, a lengthy question, but I think it boils down to uh, to two things. Um, so one is the question of whether when you're talking about perception, and you just said perceptual awareness, when you're talking about perception, you're actually talking about experience. So, so part one of my question is why should we believe that potential affordances are experienced? We might perceive them, we might acquire information about them, but I'm not sure that we experience them. And the second kind of semi-related uh, question is, uh, why should we believe that they're determined by salience? So, um, I guess to, I don't know how much I should try and unwrap these. Um, I guess I started from the position of thinking about what affordances are uh, when they're affordances for action. And uh, affordances for action, the set of affordances for action that we have when we uh, are in a, an environment uh, are essentially a list of things that we could act on and also the ways that we could act on them. Um, in terms of attentional affordances, the ways that we could act, the ways that we could attend, I think must be the different bases for attentional selection that we could have. So one kind of selection is purely spatial, but we can also um, attend to features. We can look out for red things, or we could look out for things that are triangle shaped. Um, so in the astronomy example, um, the 
expert astronomers have as basis for selection um, the patterns, the spatial patterns that different constellations make. Um, and they've got those as, uh, as stored routines. They have lots of experience and so they have those patterns. I'm not sure that at the point that they are um, using those patterns as the basis for selection, whether they have to actually have any experience of them. Um, running on from that a little bit, I mean, you discussed uh, Alvar Noe, and I think one of the things that uh, Alvar and Kevin O'Regan believe is that uh, unless we are attending to things, so they think uh, attention is both necessary and sufficient for awareness. Uh, and the implication of that is that the things that are outside our current focus of attention, which might capture our attention subsequently, aren't experienced. They're only experienced when we attend to them. So the process of, of capture is actually not experienced. Um, so that, those are those are kind of quest those are those are those are things that led me to um, worry about whether um, attentional affordances are experienced. They might be perceived, but not necessarily experienced. The second thing, kind of going back to the astronomy example. Um, but now we might take the desk example. So in the desk example, um, I'm looking at my desk and it's a cluttered desk. And my suspicion is then that what a cluttered desk gives me is a gist. I, I get this gist, okay, it's a desk, but I don't, I don't perceive the details of all of the things on the desk. Um, but it gives me, a, again, a range of um, potential targets for attention. So a list of potential bases for selection. Um, and those bases for selection are, you know, non-spatial. So they're things like, uh, you know, a round dark brown area might be a pretty good cue that there's a mug of coffee there. Um, I think if we actually, you know, really acquired the details of everything in the cluttered scene um, before attending, we wouldn't need to attend. Um, so we, we must, all of that stuff that's, uh, you know, giving us potentials for attention must be rather limited in terms of the, the detail of information that we have. Um, So again, going on from the, the gist thing, um, there's pretty good evidence. Um, so for example, from Jeff Underwood's studies of eye movements, uh, when we look at scenes, that there are many things beyond salience that determine where we move our eyes and what we attend to. Uh, and in fact, the priority map example was a, was a fabulous example of that because the most highly salient item in the stimulus was the yellow triangle which differed tremendously from the background and from the, the red uh, circle and, and squares but the attentional set that we had which was not determined by physical salience at all was to look out for the uh, red circle and in the priority map that's what stood out. So it wasn't the physically salient item that stood out. In that case, it was the item that we had an attentional set for. In the Jeff Underwood and in my desk example, it's the things that uh, we have uh, um, that arise from the gist. Uh, and so those are both things which are, um, I think, determining where we attend potentially attend, but which are not determined by salience. Sorry, that was a rather long ramble, but <laughs> you get... I, I, got it, I got it all. That's, that's great. I think I can answer all of that. That's really valuable. So, I mean, one thing is there's a slight terminological problem that sometimes people use salience to mean physical salience, which is the property of how much something contrasts with its background or contrasts with a prior state. 
uh, and a lot of philosophers use salience to instead mean priority, right? Which is that thing, which is a combination of the bottom up stuff, physical salience, and the top down stuff, which is what's relevant to the task, right? And in the empirical literature, some people made the distinction between salience and priority. And then a few people just describe priority as salience, right? So it's just a terminological minefield. So what I should say to be precise is that um, attention is guided by priority, not by physical salience. Okay. Um, I also think we're not aware of the bases of the salience of things. Okay. So I have a visual experience and my experience says there's something attendable over here. It might even say there's something attendable over here and look, you should attend to it or something. But it doesn't say why it's given me that result any more than my visual experience tells me why something's been categorized as red or something. I just get the result. Um, so when it comes to um, Noe and O'Regan's suggestion that attention is necessary and sufficient for consciousness, um, firstly, I think there's reasons to doubt that. But even like if it's true, sure, yeah, okay, so I could just deny it, right? But I think what's important is making the distinction between focal attention and peripheral attention. And that fits with what's intuitive and it also fits with the empirical evidence, right? So the actions I'm talking about are acts of focal attention. So it might still be true that you can only perceive something when you're attending to it, but it's definitely not the case that you can only perceive something when you're focally attending to it. Okay, so that means a peripheral item that is getting a tiny bit of my attention is perceptible, and then I perceive it as focally attendable. I focus on it, and then I get a load more information. Okay. Now, as to this question of whether um, um, our perception of attention from affordances is unconscious. It's a live possibility and it ties in with like the dorsal ventral stream stuff. The idea is this kind of this unconscious process guiding action and so on. But really, I think the evidence against that is reflection on what our first person experience is like. So even though that's really hard to pin down and really hard to argue about, that's why those first person cases are important because how else do you tell whether something's conscious? Am I thinking about what your consciousness is like on the inside? So I think we have first person reason to think that we perceptually experience attention or affordances rather than merely perceiving them unconsciously. And when it comes to ways of attending, I'm completely on board with this idea that we can attend spatially to features, to objects. I also think there's differences in the distribution of attention. So you can attend very focally or attend in a more distributed way. And I'd like to look into the possibility of whether our awareness of attentional affordances is nuanced in that way. Okay, so is it the case that something doesn't just call out for our attention, but calls out for our focal attention or our diffuse attention? So I think that's an interesting open question. Thank you very much for the Thank question. Thank you very much, Tom. Um, if you don't mind, we are, we are, <laughs> all right, we don't have any more time, but we have one last question, if you don't mind, I'm just gonna read it. Is that okay? Yeah, of course, yeah. Eunice, uh, what could be the affordances involved on the perception of recurrent mental states, like jealousy, for example, involving, involving body states like heart beating? Um, yeah, that, that's a really good question. So there's, there's two things to note here. Firstly, there's an interesting possibility that everything I've said about attention and affordances applies to things in your own head as well as things in your environment okay so you might be thinking through a load of options of what to do tomorrow and maybe like with your eyes closed you can kind of have this mental field of attendabilia things that you can direct your um mental attention on and some of those might grab your attention more than others right? i think that's i think that's true um it gets even more complicated where there's this kind of mixture of mental components and bodily components. And I think if you think about what goes on with cognitive behavioral therapy, what you're trained to do is to attend to what's going on in your mind and your body in different ways. So maybe one of the problems with anxiety is that your attention is excessively occupied with your high heart rate or something. And one of the things you need to do to ameliorate that anxiety is learn to attend in different ways. And I think that learning process can be usefully framed in terms of intentional affordances and alterations to how we're sensitive to attentional affordances. So I've, uh, I've done a bit more work applying this stuff to various um, psychiatric disorders and so on, uh, and I think it applies quite nicely.
Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to thank you all again for participating. Thanks, Tom, for willing to give this talk. It was wonderful. Congratulations on your work. Thank you, Giovanni and Elena, for accepting the invitation as well. Thank you, Cesar, for the support. And I hope you all enjoyed uh, this webinar.